All right, welcome back to our study on Mark. And we, I don't know, I, I heard good things about uh, our new uh, Bible study format. I think people liked that, you know, we're engaging and, and talking through it. And I guess it makes it more connected rather than just a talking head looking at a, at a screen. I guess so. So I'm glad you like it. Uh, I like it, by the way. It's better than me staring at a screen alone. So <laughs> I'm glad you're here, Jillian, to... Uh, to, uh, to be with me. And so, why don't we begin with prayer, and then we'll dive into our next section. My Father, it is your word, and we are, I am super excited to be able to dive in and to know you better. I pray that your Holy Spirit would lead and guide our conversation in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so our next section, um, where we left off last time, was Peter's mother-in-law was healed. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jesus... Uh, she rose up out of the bed and started serving. And I, I don't know, I kind of love that. that. That imagery of this this lady who served her whole life, as soon as she's well, mm -hmm. she's serving again. And um, she reminds me of my grandmother. That's probably exactly what she would do. If she was well, she would just get up and start serving. So, yeah. um, Love languages. Total, yeah, right? Acts of service. There it is. All right, so we're in the book of Mark and chapter 1, and we're beginning with verse 32 is where I get to start my section. And so... The Bible says, at evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick, those who were demon-possessed, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases, cast out many demons, and he did not allow the demons to speak, because they knew him. All right, there's a few things here that, that jump out at me that I'd like to just kind of bring attention to. And then the first thing is, is that the people were waiting until the sun set to bring their sick, their yes. demon-possessed, their wounded. This is, this is the same Sabbath as everything at Capernaum with the, with the healing of the demoniac and Peter's mother-in-law. Yeah, which means long that day. it's a long day. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't, and, and you know, maybe I'm reading too much into this, but I don't see Jesus complaining about it. Um, I, I think he loved doing it. Mm -hmm. um, he, he wanted to help people. Yeah. So, something, you, okay, uh, I don't know if you've ever felt this. Do you ever feel like you, you bring so much to God that he's tired of hearing you? I don't, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like he must get so tired of me bringing the same thing over and over to him. Why doesn't he just say, you know, to, he probably turns it off. Uh, but he doesn't. Uh, from here, I get the picture that God doesn't tire of helping those in need. No. Um, he always has energy. He always has a willingness to help when, when we need him. Because all these people came by the droves. Um, and it says the whole city. Yeah. I don't know what that means. I don't know what a whole city is. I think it's just a lot of people. Maybe it wasn't the whole city. I, I don't know. I wasn't there. But... It, um, it probably felt like the whole city was there, lined up at the door, Jesus in, healing person after person. In 2019, I had the pleasure of going to Capernaum uh, with this church on the last flying trip before COVID hit. Okay. Um, and the thing that I found interesting is that the synagogue, where everything happened in the morning, is really very close to the house where Jesus was healing, where Jesus mm -hmm. healed Peter's mother-in-law. So maybe by the whole city they mean a heap ton of people from the synagogue. It's it's not that large of a place, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe it's smaller than what my you know Capernaum seems to be one of the larger cities uh, in the in Galilee. But then again, I, I don't have perspective. I wasn't there, but it seems that way by the names that get dropped in the New Testament. Capernaum is you know one of the big ones, or it yeah. seems that way. Um. The city's gathered at the door, the Bible says, and then he healed many who were sick, various diseases, cast out many demons, and didn't allow the demons to speak because they knew him. So um, it just seemed like all night. I don't know. When would it end? When the lines end? Do they, do they turn people away like the master's done? It's been a long night. You know, if you're sick, come back tomorrow. Does he wait till every person that's been waiting in line is, is satisfied and taken care of? Um, I have a little story, so I'll throw it in, personal, personal story. It. Mark Finley came and preached at the college church. Okay. 
at uh, South Lancaster, Massachusetts, and I was a student at the time, so this is a lot of years ago, and my pastor, David Berthew, came to hear Mark Finley preach, and when he was done preaching, Mark came down the pulpit and stood at the front and a line formed all the way up the aisle, into the foyer. There must have been 100 people in line to meet Mark Finley. Wow. I, I don't know. I've never had people line up after a sermon to meet me like that. So I guess I'm not Mark Finley status. But it doesn't matter. My pastor grabbed me and said, you have to meet Mark Finley. And I said, Pastor, that's so embarrassing. No, he's fine. He can meet all these other people. Look, everybody. No, no, no. You have to meet him. So think about it. I mean, everybody's going to lunch. All, all the normal people are eating. Mark right. Finley is standing at the front of the church listening to, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be insulting, <laughs> listening to people share their woes or, you know, sign my book or whatever it is, right? I, I don't know. To me, nothing really important, but they're interrupting his day and his life. I feel terrible. The closer I get, I feel more and more guilty that I'm even there, but my pastor's not letting me go. I get to the front of the line, and by that time, I'm just anxious, and out of anxious energy, I lean forward, and I said, I am so sorry, Mark, that you have to stand here and greet all of us. And then he leaned forward and whispered in my ear, and I'll never forget what he said. He said, if I didn't love people, I wouldn't be a pastor. Right. And, you know, I realized then something that stuck with me my whole ministry is mm -hmm. that Pastoring is about people. Absolutely. And that's the one thing I don't want to be tired of. I can be tired of meetings. I can be tired mm -hmm. of writing emails. I can be tired <laughs> of... Um, Sorry, I, I laughed at the email thing because when I got back from vacation, I had over 100 waiting for me. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, hey, by the way, I told Carol, I said, don't send her emails. And she's like, she doesn't look at them when she's on vacation. When she gets back, she'll comb through them all. And I'm like... That's terrible. She'll have a hundred of them. It was literally a hundred. Oh, man. That's rotten. I just love that. And I think it says something about God. He didn't get tired. And he stayed, I think, it doesn't say, my opinion, he stayed till the end because that's who he was. He wasn't going to let someone sick go home without hearing his voice or being touched by him. I just love this moment. Yeah. Um, 35. Now in the morning, having risen a long while, now wait a minute, he's up all night, I don't know what time the sun went down, 6, 7, and then people are there by the droves, the whole city, maybe several hundred people there to be mm -hmm. healed, and he's, and he's up early in the morning, risen a long while before daylight, so the, what time does the sun come up here, 5, 5.30, he's there a long while, he, what is he there, at 3 in the morning, 4, I don't know. But, but if he's going to bed at midnight or 1 and he's waking up at 3 or 4 to go pray. Sometimes after a long day like that, there's just so much adrenaline in your system that you can't sleep much mm. longer than a few hours. You ever have that experience? No, I sleep like the dead. <laughs> I, I have no problem sleeping at all. <laughs> there, there have been some weekends here where, like, um, if I had... Sabbath school, mm -hmm. church, and then Pathfinders, and then Get Connected, back when that was a thing. And then I had Adventurers the next morning. I'm going to wake up at like 3.30 because I didn't eat properly the day before or whatever. <laughs> you know? Uh, we, uh, there's been a lot of long Sabbaths. People, people do not understand that Sabbath is not a relaxing day, ever. It is the hardest day of the week. It is, uh, I, I need Sunday to recover from Saturday. Um, you know what I'm talking about. Oh yeah, yeah. oh yeah. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's a it's it's tiring, um, and sometimes yeah, I, I have trouble sleeping at night because I keep going over in my brain all the things that happen during the day. It's sure. just so much information to process, even from Sabbath morning alone. You're crunching so much that happened in such a short period of time. Totally. Yeah. So he goes to this solitary place and he prays, and it says something about the value that Jesus placed upon prayer. And it says something about the lack of value, I think, generally, we all put on prayer. Mm -hmm. um, because on a day like that, I would sleep in. I wouldn't be waking up extra early to go to spend time with God. I would mm -hmm. sleep as long as I could, probably. Um, but it just says something about 
where Jesus placed this value. And then verse 36, it gets worse. I think it gets worse, right? He, he, he cannot catch a break. Simon and all those who were with him, so that means the disciples or the, yeah. the, 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 his followers, right? Searched for him. And when they found him, they said to him, everybody's looking for you. Where have you been? How dare you go away by yourself? There's this huge crowd of people. The whole city wants to talk to you. They want to meet you. Um, I, I just wish... No, no, I don't. But I do. Both. I just wish sometimes ministry were like that, right? That it would be just so easy that people would just by the droves, like, everybody's looking for you. You know, they want to hear you more. Um, I think I'm happy sometimes when I go on YouTube and I see 20 people watch my sermon. I'm like, yeah! That's such a victory! To think about the impact that Jesus had on people's lives, that it really touched them, that it made a difference, and that they wanted to be near him. They wanted to, to hear him more. But he doesn't go back. This is so strange. And I have to tell you, this is weird. He said to them, let's go into the next towns so I can preach there also, because for this purpose I have come. I don't know, if I had a large crowd of people that wanted to hear me, I wouldn't want to go to them. Mm -hmm. Jesus is like, no, no, we've already done that. Let's, let's go somewhere else. That's, that's why I'm here. I'm not here for them. I'm here for everybody. So we're going to go to another town that doesn't know me. Let's go. It's like that time in prayer was a centering thing to keep him from getting distracted from what he was really about. I mean, one of the dangers of a busy life, whether in ministry or regular, um, just mm -hmm. daily life living, is of no longer measuring success by the right criteria, of forgetting mm -hmm. what your core values and what you're all about is. And prayer has this way of... of us giving God permission to mm -hmm. readjust us back to what matters. He was definitely successful. Right? Isn't it a temptation when... Success can be more dangerous than failure. Sure! <laughs> I mean, how... yeah, yeah, totally. I, I agree. Some of the diff most difficult times that I've struggled with was not when, you know, the church was empty, but when it was full. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. So he says, let's go, and he was preaching in the synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. And I think there's this common theme, and I don't, I don't think we have the time to really spend a lot of time on it, but there's this balance of preaching and healing. Yes. And he did both. And I don't know, I, if I'm just commenting from my perspective, I don't mm -hmm. think we have good balance in this area. No. I think we are a lot more preaching and very little healing, if at all. Well, I, the other thing that I notice is that I am so proud to be Adventist when it comes to our grand medical institutions. Mm -hmm. But I see a divorce between the work of healing done in our hospitals and the work of preaching in our churches. It feels like these things are too disconnected from each other, whereas with him they were intimately tied. Yeah, yeah. and I think that the work that they're doing is good. I just Absolutely. think that we should Necessary. not... That we should not think like oh the healing's happening over there so therefore we are healed no yeah jesus healed and preached together it was his lifestyle yeah. so in other words just because they're doing it doesn't mean we're doing it mm -hmm. um I, I feel like it sh the healing ministry of christ still needs to be in the church even if that's the motto of the the hospital mm -hmm. it still needs to be the motto of the church while yeah. we preach yeah. i think anyway it's a can of worms i really don't want to get into it too deeply <laughs> um anyway here at verse 40 a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. That's interesting. He, he knows Jesus can make him clean, but I guess his question is, is Jesus willing? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I counsel people all the time as a pastor. They come to me with their hurts and their problems. The number one question that they really have is, is he willing? Mm. Um. Because their sin, their lifestyle choices, maybe they haven't been to church in a long time. Maybe, yeah. uh, maybe they're guilt, they feel guilty or ashamed of um, where their life has been. Um, and so they don't feel that God would be willing to help them because they haven't been good enough. Mm. Um, and it's sad to see, because it's a misunderstanding of who God is. Uh, nobody's good enough. <laughs> Nobody deserves the blessing or the healing. Uh, we're all, we're all lepers. We're all sick. Um, 
Isaiah chapter 1 describes that. There's no soundness in us that, that we're putrid, um, we're rotten. Uh, and it's describing the body, and it's basically describing what leprosy is. And there's yeah. Isaiah giving this apt description. Mm. Um, but, but, the, but this leper falls before Jesus and cries out, if you are willing. Now, mm. I, I, don't, I can't preach a whole sermon on leprosy. It's, you know, one of those fun things to preach about. But suffice to say, you don't touch these people. You could do a whole series on leprosy. Oh, yeah, totally. It's just, um, it's just a really powerful sermon series. Anyway, verse 41 Jesus was moved with compassion, stretched out his hand, and touched him, and said to him, I am willing to be cleansed. Mm -hmm. Because he already believed that he could cleanse him. Yeah. The question was, was he willing? Um, but Jesus touched him. He didn't have to touch him. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. Jesus was breaking the law. <laughs> he was. Ceremonial law was very <laughs> clear that you don't touch. Yes. You don't touch an unclean thing. Mm -hmm. Or an unclean person, um, or or you have to ritually wash. You have to, uh, you know, it's a whole, it's a big deal. You, but you do not do it. No, <laughs> Jesus did it. Yeah. Um, which says something, <laughs> and and I know I have not many minutes left to to get into this, but it says something about priorities. Mm. What, what is the what is the church's priority? What is a Christian's priority? And I feel like Jesus is telling us that people are more important than rules. And I know that that gets me into a can of worms. But I'm just, saying, <laughs> I'm just saying that Jesus here was showing us something. That this man being touched, was it was more important to do that than it was to keep that, that health law that was in the Bible to protect us against being sick. This man needed to be touched. And, you know... I, uh, again, it's a thing about God. It just excites me mm -hmm. that he that he 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 wanted to do that for him to let him know that he loved him. Well, it also shows how the life giver can't be defiled by your stuff. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> there are contagious diseases. There are there there are difficult things out in this world that we easily hurt each other with. But we can't hurt God with them. Not at all. Uh, he's, a, he's a well springing up into eternal life. And a well cannot become unclean if something unclean touches it. Yeah. Because new water is constantly pouring into it. So yeah. therefore the whole thing isn't unclean. And I think that, you know, that's the illustration of it. Jesus is a well of life. He Absolutely. cannot become unclean. Um, as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Um, so immediately, uh, how long does it take for God to make us clean? How long does God need to rearrange our atoms, to, to take away our sickness, to, to remove our iniquity? How long does it take? A, li a lifetime? No, it's, it's immediately. God, is in a touch, in a second, he's completely clean. There's no trace of the disease. It isn't cleansed over months it doesn't say that slowly it left him and then after years of struggle and drugs and mm -hmm. chemotherapy he was better it isn't that it's just boom it's gone just like it was a miracle and i you know i don't know my appeal today is that whatever you're going through there's a god who can heal you immediately not that he always does i'm not promising that but he can and when you go to him and you throw yourself at, at his feet um, there's an opportunity, the potential there for a miracle every time you come to Jesus because he is able. So the Bible says he strictly, Jesus strictly warned the leper and sent him away at once. And he said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone. Go your way, show yourself to the priest, offer your, um, your cleansing, those things which Moses commanded as a testimony. So if he was poor, he would bring turtle doves or if he had more money, he might bring. But there was an offering you had to bring. Mm -hmm. Verse 45, however, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in deserted places. And they came to him from every direction. Uh -huh. It's interesting how this one man 
by his testimony mm. affected the influence of Jesus for the rest of his ministry. Yeah. It's, it's not a little thing to disobey when God asks us to do something. Mm -hmm. We can impact the kingdom of heaven. This man impacted the kingdom of heaven. Um, I, I, I'm trying to make a big deal out of it because sometimes we read this and we'll make the comments, you know, we have these normal comments that we make about this moment, right? About how, you know, maybe he thought Jesus was just like being humble or whatever. Something that this man did affected Jesus in such a way that he couldn't any longer openly preach and heal in the cities. He had to be way out in the desert places simply because this man didn't listen when he told them, mm -hmm. don't speak. Um, I, I, yeah, I don't know, to me it says something, personally, it says something about the way that I carry myself, some of the choices that I make can actually impact the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. And if I act in a way that dishonors heaven, sometimes it can even affect the gospel and how it spreads. It can affect the church and how it's able to relate to the community. I and mean, it can affect a lot of things, my choice, my decision. Yeah. And this guy's not a, a pastor of a big church. This guy is a leper. He doesn't probably yeah. have even many friends, but he still impacted the kingdom of heaven. So how important for us to, to make sure that we honor God with our choices, with our attitude, um, because we will have an impact. We will. We will have an impact. Um, you know, thank you for listening. Uh, that's the end of our study today. And um, I'm so excited for you to join us next week on Thursday night. We're just going to keep doing this every Thursday night. And uh, I hope you find it as much of a blessing that, that we find it. Um, Jillian, would you mind closing your prayer for us? Sure. Lord God, we thank you and we praise you that you're the Lord who heals. Lord God, sometimes our prayers, sometimes our prayers underestimate your power mm. and forget that you are the life giver. Lord God, give us the willingness to turn our hearts to you and to come to you for healing. Mm -hmm. Don't let us don't don't let us keep trying to wait until we're better or trying to make ourselves better. Yes. Let us come to you so that we can let you, the great physician, heal us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.